Yeah, the, the issue of safe sex fatigue. I don't think we have numbers uh, related to that, but just, I'm sick and tired of it. It's such a hassle. I just want to have sex. Uh, yeah, and that's a big issue that's coming up that needs to be addressed in counseling, and how are we going to negotiate that? And what does that mean in the face of PEP and PrEP and viral suppression and all of that kind of stuff? I don't think we as providers have worked out all of those issues as well. So, many older people are recently single because they finally went, get out, or their partner died. Um, and so, sex outside of a primary relationship that may have been there for a very long time may be a whole new thing to them. And again, there's multiple issues of discrimination and health disparities that we know exist um, we just don't know exactly how they impact these particular issues, but it's something that we need to keep in the forefront and hopefully get better data about. About two-thirds of new HIV cases in older adults, this is in part uh, in relationship to someone's question, I think your question, uh, about two-thirds are among MSM, but a much higher proportion of older adults report, say, I don't know where I got it, right? than they do in other populations, which to me points to the stigma associated with certain kinds of sexual behavior, with certain kinds of drug use behavior. Um, it may be indeed that some people don't know how to do it, but it doesn't explain why there's a much higher proportion here. So I think they're not as comfortable talking to us as we're not comfortable talking with them. Um, yeah, I beat those to death, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. To teach each other. Yeah. Yeah. Your pronoun is really important. We get shocked about stuff, right? The old ladies having the sex party so they can teach each other how to use vibrators. See how uncomfortable it is to talk about that, right? Absolutely. But if we're not smart enough to talk to them about it, right. That's exactly right. If we're not smart enough to talk to them about it, they're smart enough to say, to not say to you, I'm having an old lady sex partner party so we can teach each other about vibrators. And by the way, I'm embarrassed to get my vibrator. I can't order it through the mail, so I have to drive all the way to San Diego to get it. How many layers of stigma are in that one scenario, right? Societal stigma, personal stigma, age-related stigma, ethnicity-related stigma, and then we simply take that population and turn to the 78-year-old guy who came out to his wife for the first time and has maybe had a few dalliances over the course of his life but has never really explored his sexuality in that way as well. And we end up with exactly the same thing with a whole different set of kinds of circumstances. We have to be willing to talk about these things. Thank you very much for that story. Hmm. Yeah. 
That was quite a Pepsi, right? <laughs> yeah. And as you were saying, again, a lot of older adults are either exploring with or continuing to use substances that they brought with them from their past. Last comment on this, and then we're going to move on. So we kind of ran into the same issue with that. There isn't a lot of breakout of the existing data, unfortunately. So we have some statistics, like two thirds of the new cases are MSM, and we can kind of extrapolate, but there's nothing really hard and fast that breaks out those demographics specifically, unfortunately. That would be great to know, especially considering what we're seeing in clinics or agencies, but unfortunately the research doesn't quite break that out at this time. Right? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Really so important consideration. Oh, I'm going to go steal on. a bit of, of Jim's thunder from the end, but we, in treatment, we just have to assume the risk, right? We just have to assume that these issues are going on and we have to talk about them. And we have to take grandpa and say, have you ever had sex with another guy? in spite of the fact that he's been married for 60 years, right? We just have to make that routine part. We have to ask grandma about her sexuality and her sex behavior and what's working and what's not for her right now so that we can do that appropriate education. We have to ask about drug use, et cetera. So drug use is an invisible epidemic in the older population. I'm not going to beat these to death. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Um, they affect up to 17% of older adults. but Often, as you were saying, that the symptoms mimic or mask other symptoms. And so we may attribute to natural aging or cognitive decline related to dementia kind of processes a substance use issue rather than seeing it as a cognitive issue rather than as a substance use issue or vice versa. Granny's always drunk, so of course she has some cognitive issues. We take the alcohol away and we see an underlying cognitive issue that's being masked by that anyway. Um, Marijuana is the most commonly used drug. About 4.8 million older adults are using marijuana most commonly. Second most commonly are prescription painkillers. Um, publicly funded treatment admissions have nearly doubled from 92 to 2008. Unfortunately, that's the most recent data we were able to get from that, but I'm assuming that trend has continued. Just look at this. This is past month use. They've used in the last 30 days of any substance. Right? What do you notice? It's up, it's up, it's up. It's, oops, it's up in the uh, youngest of the older adult age groups. My pointer's not working anymore. It's up in the 55 to 59, and it's up in the oldest adult population. That oldest adult population is the lowest risk, but we see that continued upward tick across the course of years. I'm sorry? No, alcohol is always number one. Thank you. This is illicit drugs. Um, alcohol is always number one. And something, if you're focused on drugs, you don't ask about alcohol. If you're focused on alcohol, you don't ask about drugs. We have to ask about both. Because alcohol and marijuana are fairly ubiquitous, and then we get other kinds of things. So here's the alcohol slide. Uh, under age 50 and older, over age 50, um, we see that slightly more older people are drinking at all but they have, slight, they have lower risk of binge drinking um, than their younger adult counterparts. Marijuana use in older adults has been steadily increasing across the older adult age groups since 2002. Now, emergency department admissions relate, that are related in some way to marijuana use went from about 3,600 in uh, 2004 to 14,000 in 2010. One of my questions is, why are people going to the ER for, for marijuana? 
I don't think we know the answer to that. All it means is they went into the ER and that when they asked them what was going on, marijuana was mentioned during that visit. That's how these data are collected. And so we know that there was marijuana on board or somehow the patient saw it as related to their hospital admission. But that went from 3,000 to 14,000 in the course of uh, about six years. Alcohol is still the most common substance that people are going into treatment for, but we have to consider some of the less used drugs as well. Um, older adult admissions for heroin more than doubled between 92 and 2008. And again, as prescription drugs, if they develop a habit on prescription drugs, they become too expensive. There are other cheaper options available, and generally that's heroin. And black tar heroin in the Western US is really, really cheap but it also means they're probably going to be injecting as well. We can't answer that from these data. All we can say is these are treatment admissions among older adult populations, and the rate of those treatment admissions has increased. See how much data we're missing? It's, it's unfortunate. Cocaine use has also gone up in the older adult population. But again, if we think of the boomers, what a surprise, right? They're used to using these kinds of drugs, and so we're seeing it move into this population. If we look at HIV-positive people and whether or not they had a history of lifetime dependence of alcohol, what we find is in this younger age group, if they had, um, they were much more like, how does this work? <laughs> I had this. between their HIV positive, if they have lifetime alcohol dependence, yes or no in those age ranges, what is the probability that they have a lifetime alcohol dependence? 60% of those who don't have Thank you. alcohol dependence have another non-alcohol substance use. So three quarters of those who have alcohol dependence also have another substance Did you get that? So if, if they have alcohol dependence and HIV, all of these have HIV, 60% of them, if they don't have an alcohol dependence, all had some other substance use disorder. If they did have alcohol dependence, 78% had some other substance use disorder. Among the older population, if they didn't have an alcohol use disorder, four in 10 had some other substance use disorder, but two-thirds did if they did have an alcohol. So this association between alcohol and other substance use is really high. Sometimes data is really tough, isn't it? <laughs> Just a couple more words on alcohol, and then I'm going to get out of here. Um, the first is, what's a drink? Some of you guys have seen this before, but if we're going to talk about what people are drinking, we have to talk about what people are drinking. And so a beer, it depends on how much alcohol is in the, the liquid that you're drinking as to how much you can have and have it be a standard drink. So a beer is a standard 12 ounce bottle of beer, like the mass market beers that are 46% alcohol sold in stores. If you order a beer in a restaurant, how does that normally come? What kind of glass? What do they call that glass? A pint, that's exactly right. This is not a traditional pint glass, but it is a pint. That's 12 ounces in a pint glass. And so if you order a beer in a restaurant, you've actually not had one beer, you've had one and a third beers. If you drink two of those, whether you're a man or a woman, you do that within the average span of a dinner, which is somewhere on one side or the other of an hour, you've had almost three beers and you're probably over the legal limit to drive. ruh -roh. Um, so how we count makes a big difference. What about wine? How much wine can you have and have it be a standard drink? By the way, how many glasses of wine should you get out of a standard bottle of wine? <laughs> you guys are heavy pourers. <laughs> Someone up here went three, oh, no, four, that's also wrong. You should be able to get five glasses of wine, standard glasses of wine, out of a standard 720 milliliter bottle, and there will be about that much left in the bottom of the bottle. The average person pours four, but some people obviously pour heavier than that. By the way, when you serve in a big red wine glass, this is five ounces, right? Most people will pour to about halfway. Restaurants also pour to about halfway because if they served you this, they'd be like, what's up with that? And by the way, this is, this is a restaurant glass, and so it's actually tapered really finely down here, so it makes the level of alcohol look 
higher. If you get one that you have at home, they're generally much flatter, and so it looks even smaller in the glass. Restaurants generally pour seven to nine ounces, and they charge you an associated amount for that. But again, two glasses of wine over dinner, you're probably over the legal limit to drive. And finally, how, many, how much hard liquor can you drink? Well, the answer is a jigger. That's the bigger shot glass in a double-sided shot. An ounce is one shot, an ounce and a half is a jigger. Now, in a highball glass with no ice, that is an ounce and a half of alcohol. Okay, so it's not very much. If you add ice to that, it'll go up to about there, right? So most people, when they pour, pour themselves at least two standard drinks when they pour into a highball glass. But how many glasses, how many standard drinks are in an LIT? And if you don't understand that acronym, that's a Long Island iced tea. How many standard drinks? That's the right answer. Who the heck knows? It just depends on who the bartender is and how much they like you. They've shown between two and five standard drinks in a single glass, just depending on how the bartender pours that particular drink. Now, we don't want to beat our patients to death to find out exactly what they're drinking, but knowing what they're drinking and what they're drinking it out of becomes really important. By the way, if you drink a lot of craft beer, where the alcohol is seven, nine, or more percent, you need to think of it more like wine at five ounces than like beer at 12 ounces. But knowing what they're drinking and what they're drinking it out of can go a long way to helping us understand this issue. So how many of these can you have and still be drinking at non-risky levels? For the general population, here's the answer. Men can have no more than four standard drinks on any given day and no more than two, 14 drinks over the course of a week. That is no more than two standard drinks a day on average. You with me so far? Some people will go, that's a lot, right? But according to the data in NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, if someone's drinking at that level, they're unlikely to place, be placing themselves at risk for alcohol dependence or for other health-related complications. For women, it's no more than three drinks per day and no more than seven drinks per week. Why do you guys get ripped off? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, in essence, Andrew's going to talk about how we metabolize alcohol in just a minute, but in essence, women are less efficient al alcohol metabolizers than their male counterparts are because of body fat to water ratios, because of body mass, because of how the, the, the uh, enzymes work inside the body. They're less efficient alcohol metabolizers. So men tend to drink socially with men or women? Men, that's right. Women tend to drink socially with men, right? And women go occasionally out to drinks with a girlfriend, but generally on average, women tend to drink socially with men. So a man and a woman go out to dinner. He orders a drink, she orders a drink. He orders a drink, she orders a drink, of course, right? When they get up from that table, she'll have a higher blood alcohol content than he will. Over time, this has a, a, an effect that they call the telescoping effect of alcohol on women. When women enter treatment, they're sicker by every measure that we have of alcohol dependence. They have more serious withdrawal, they're more likely to drop out of treatment, they're more likely to use during treatment, and they're more likely to use more during treatment when they do relapse. So we have to pay particular attention to women. Now, for older adults, the numbers are the same as for women. So that man who's been drinking two beers, of, of, uh, two beers every day after work, two beers watching the game on the weekend every day for 30 years is a low risk drinker until the day he hits 65. And he goes from a low risk drinker to a high risk drinker simply by virtue of aging, because as we age, we become less efficient alcohol metabolizers. So NIAAA considers more than one drink per day problematic. It is more than moderate use, and we'd want to address that. So where we're thinking of, you know, oh, well, he only has a couple or three or four beers a time, he's actually drinking if he's in this older adult population at pretty significant rates. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, and he's going to talk us through how alcohol is actually metabolized. All right. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> so we've talked about why these drinking guides, what they are. Why is that? <clears throat> if we take a look at how alcohol is metabolized, we know that in older adults, there are changes in the body that occur as an adult gets older. Decreases in body water, decreases in alcohol dehydrogenase. 
what happens when you drink alcohol is it's metabolized in the liver. And one of the enzymes that does that turns it into acetaldehyde, which is actually formaldehyde, which is actually poisonous to the body. So we want to get rid of that in the body. And that's done by another liver enzyme, which turns it into acetate. And then that's expelled from the body. It's eliminated either as water or CO2. <clears throat> this enzyme decreases in functioning. There are lower concentrations as an individual gets older, which impairs the metabolization of the alcohol. Um, it's also, that also means that it's eliminated more slowly because of reduced blood flow to the liver and the kidneys. So these processes aren't as efficient. So that recommendation of three drinks per day, seven drinks per week, that's the guideline, but the recommendation of really one is really what we're looking at is due to this. It's not going to be metabolized as quickly. And certainly, if you're thinking about, okay, this is turned into formaldehyde, the presence of that in the body is not going to be good. <clears throat> We also know that older adults will receive a higher blood alcohol content from any given dose uh, compared to younger individuals. They'll get more impairment from that uh, blood alcohol content. Uh, uh, there are specific interactions between alcohol. Uh, if they have chronic illnesses or medications, beta blockers, nitrates will have a very specific interaction with alcohol. It can actually reduce blood pressure to uh, concerning levels. And then overall, again, the decrease in lean body mass decrease in bone density, muscle density, and then an increase in percentage of body fat with aging all contributes to the way alcohol is metabolized. That's all we're going to say about the biology of alcohol, just to uh, help you understand that having that in the system, it's going to stay there in a different way than younger individuals. So who is actually drinking? Tom talked about that telescoping effect, kind of the social dynamics of people going out and drinking. What we see is that men typically drink more than women overall. So we see that about half aren't drinking anything whatsoever. But those who are having that moderate level, that recommended one or less than one drink a day, it's about one third of men, a little bit higher, and then just a little bit lower for women. And then those who are having more than one drink per day, again, a little bit higher in men, uh, two to 3% for women. So we know that overall, men continue to drink a little bit more than women, even as they age. Uh, some data from a national epidemiological study show that about 8,000 adults in this study, uh, 65 and older, three quarters reported ever using alcohol. Um, it's a little bit higher. We know that current drinkers usually across the entire population, 12 and older, is about 50%. 50% uh, reported alcohol using alcohol in the past 12 months. And then if they looked at past year drinkers, about two thirds were light drinkers. So again, using that breakdown of three drinks or less. About 20% were moderate drinkers, again, using that breakdown for men and for women, the 4 to 14, 4 to 7. Uh, and then about 11% were heavy drinkers. So the majority were in the light drinking population, but there was still a pretty significant distribution between the moderate and the heavy drinkers. How does this break down across the entire age range? We think about alcohol use, addiction, this is a disease of the young, right? We see that typically spike in late adolescence, early adulthood. We know if we can get somebody past the age of about 21 without developing serious substance use disorders, they're at lower risk of developing addiction. We see the same thing with alcohol use. So if we look at the current binge drinking, heavy alcohol use distribution among individuals 50 plus, it tends to go down. So the binge drinking, the gray area, it decreases as an individual gets older. But what we notice is that overall, the use still stays relatively high. We're looking at about half of the individuals 50 plus still being current drinkers. So this is a huge concern if you're seeing somebody in treatment. You definitely want to ask about alcohol use. Because we know that even if they're not binge drinking or drinking heavily, if they're regularly having that one drink, that's still considered moderate use. And there's some health risks that come along with that. It's certainly something that we want to focus on. There are other circumstances that affect when and how an individual drinks, how much they drink. Uh, there are some systemic factors, some demographic factors. This one in particular is going to lead into the next slide. We're looking at who's married, who lives alone, what are the impacts of that. So total older adults, 